Thanks, Nancy. Uh, like she said, my name is Brittany Haig. I'm a horticulture educator for Livingston, McLean, Woodford counties with the University of Illinois Extension. And I have been with Extension for about eight years, probably three of that as a horticulture educator. And my focus is with youth horticulture education. I work a lot with school gardens, junior master gardener projects, um, our 4-H clubs, 4-H programs, and I just love working with youth. So I want to thank you so much for joining us today. You know, children really are these natural, um, experiential, hands-on learners who could really uh, be motivated by learning um, and exploring with these gardens, especially ones that they get to decide what it is, what the theme is. So I hope you enjoy some of the ideas that I've put together uh, for my own personal experiences. All right, so I want to start by asking all of you what your favorite children's garden is, which one, what you have visited. If you want to type it in the chat and share some of those that you have found really engaging or really fun. Um, some of the pictures on the slideshow are ones that I have visited throughout the US. Some of them probably look a little familiar to some of you, but you can probably pick out where they're from. So let's hear it. Let's see what some of your favorite children's gardens are. Morton Arboretum, that's a, that's a good one. That's my center picture. Missouri Botanic has a great one. Ooh, Minnesota, I haven't been to that one. Meyer Children's Garden, Michigan. Lots from Morton Arboretum. The Bookworm Gardens in Wisconsin. The Dow Gardens, that's a good one. So there's so many wonderful children's gardens throughout um, Illinois, throughout US. So Botanic Center at Rock Island, Brooklyn. Nice, I've been up to Brooklyn to the Botanical Garden. I have a picture here from Longwood. And um, they have a nice children's garden and then winter tour. We did that on the same trip. Wayside Gardens in Maryland, nice. Looks great. Well, thank you all so much for sharing. I'll have to add some of these to my to my list to visit someday. Um, we're, we're pretty lucky here to have such wonderful children, children's gardens. My, yeah. So why should youth garden? I know that seems like um, kind of a, an easy question for um, some of you, it's fun, it gets them outside, they learn a new skill and they, they practice some healthy habits, right? But studies show that during these formative, during our formative years, uh, we are genetically predisposed to explore our world and seek to understand it. From ages six to 12, it's commonly referred to as the middle childhood. And it's this natural period during which our children are genetically programmed to form this bond with nature. Children need to be out there in nature to explore the world around them, to seek to understand all these processes and parts and cycles. Um, children can benefit greatly from the interaction with nature in, in all aspects of their development. With phys um, physically, they build strong muscles and they stay active for their mental development or their intellectual development. And this is when they are gonna grow as a child to, and, um, have that ability to think and reason, grow that, um, grow in that development. Morally, moral development, um, this is when they're gonna learn that process through which um, they learn right and wrong. What, what is the right and wrong ways to do things? From emotional development, this is when they're gonna form and sustain those positive relationships. They're going to experience and manage and learn how to express their emotions. And um, having an interaction with nature also, with, is going to benefit nature. We're teaching these little community members to care for the land, to inspire them to want to make a difference and protect the natural world when all through their life. And then when, when nature no longer occurs naturally in their childhood, it really is essential that these our parents, educators, grandparents, whoever it may be, work to provide these opportunities for children to explore and develop this innate bond that they need with nature. So a, children, a garden for children is gonna look a little different than one you might create for yourself. 
um, it should be fun. It should be um, enchanting and, and it should offer a variety of textures and colors. They should want to go out there and play. It should appeal and engage to all five of the senses. Um, science is best taught as the students learn uh, to see, to touch, taste, hear, and smell all those common things. It should provide opportunities for discovery. Let these kids be free and dig in the dirt and discover new things every single day out in the garden. It should offer a wide range of learning experiences. So many kids are hands-on learners, so we need to give them a space to do this. It should captivate their imagination. The kids have amazing imaginations. I'm just amazed some days what my kids imagine. Um, just think of what they can imagine and dream of if you give them their own space outdoors. It should provide them a retreat to escape and relax. We all need that calming, safe place to relax. So let the garden be it for those kids. It should also um, help them take ownership of their own space, no matter how big, how small, give them something to call their own and develop that independence. And most important, um, it should instill a love of nature that will grow into the stewardship and appreciation for nature for the rest of their life. That is the most important thing I think a garden can do. So one of the best ways to encourage enthusiasm for the gardening is by creating a theme garden. And really let the kids decide Foster the love of gardening with these kids by letting them um, be creative. Let them base their theme garden off of a certain interest or a passion, you know, and, and this can vary um, from year to even days. I feel like one day my daughter really made, like she was really into dolls and then the next day it was space. So I think this is going to be evolving definitely from, from year to year. Um, the inspiration from a theme garden can really come from many things though, as, as simple as a story or favorite food to a historical event or an animal. Um, kids, like I said, kids have an amazing imagination. Let's ask them what type of theme garden they like. I'm sure we'd all be surprised if some of the creative things they could come up with. So as you brainstorm, um, let your, your little one run wild, have, free, um, have freedom to Think of, of things for their garden and then search for plants that will help you maybe ch achieve that these um, chosen theme and that will grow well in your area. So in a residential scale, um, choosing a theme garden is a good way to build your, your own child's personal interests and to narrow that scope um, to fit the, the small scale. If it's in a public space, maybe create a, um, a garden that would be interesting to any kid. So with, with Children's Garden, we want to design with a child in mind. Um, we always want to consider scale and pay attention to detail. Children are so attentive to detail where adults usually see the world on a large scale. So it may be challenging, but it's going to be really beneficial to try to see the same level of detail as through a child's eyes. So when designing for a child, um, it's important to pay attention to the scale and the view as they do. Maybe we get down on their level, sit down in the garden or on our knees and see, see what is at their eye level, what they may notice. And we have to remember these um, ideas that are for the children. It's a space purely for their benefit, their enjoyment, and it's not going to be an adult's idea of a perfect design and that's okay. And one of my professors in school once said, create a space that's uncomfortable to an adult. This isn't for them, it's for the child. So I always try to keep that in, in mind when I'm in a children's garden. And even if you don't have the space for a large garden, take some of these ideas and, and miniaturize them for a container or a set of containers that you can um, set on a front porch or a patio, or, or even if you don't have that, bring it indoors with a dish garden or a terrarium but just giving kids a space to interact with plants and grow something on their own is gonna be really empowering. So when you're choosing plants for your children's garden, they should be hardy for your area. Um, I would suggest starting with plants that are easy to grow that don't require a lot of maintenance, that they're not gonna get frustrated if um, it's gonna be a lot of work to grow. 
You want to choose plants that are interesting to children. They're fun. They're colorful. Walk into the garden centers and let them explore. Pick out plants that they think look really cool. Uh, but most importantly, our, our plants should be safe for the environment. The, even though we want kids to be outside exploring, we also want to make sure they stay safe. Um, so always make sure kids are aware of the dangers associated with poisonous plants and avoid them around whenever possible. So there are a variety of levels of toxicity. So before planting any plant, definitely check to make sure, sure that it's safe to include in your child's space. For example, um, some plants are considered to have major toxicity, like the castor bean, super cool plant, but it's, it causes serious illness or even death if it ingested. Um, others have a, a minor toxicity like, like holly berries. They can have, um, you can get minor illnesses such as vomiting or diarrhea if these are ingested. Um, but then you also have some plants that can cause skin irritations or rashes that we have to be aware of like elephant ear or even marigold sometimes causes rashes on skin. Um, so we do wanna remind kids not to eat any part of the plant unless we know um, if they're with an adult who 100% knows what the plant is. Um, so definitely check before you're planting. And here are a couple of resources that you can um, check your plants before you plant them to make sure they are safe. So now onto the fun part of all the theme garden ideas. So it was really tough for me to choose or narrow this down to only 12 themes. Um, but some, these are some of my personal favorites and some that I've um, seen have been super popular with the kids in the children's gardens. So interesting plants. Plants are so fascinating. I love them. Um, so here's a chance to share these really cool traits with the kids. Some, some perfect examples of interesting plants are carnivorous plants. What little kid isn't fascinated with the idea of an insect eating plant, like the pitcher plant. Here's, my, here's our pitcher plant. Um, or we have the um, Venus flytrap, or also a, a very cool carnivorous plant. Um, a lot of our ornamental and edible plants have really gorgeous characteristics that, um, like up here, it's, are, are so perfect. It almost looks fake passion flower or our alien look, looking Romanesco, like my kids, whoops, let me go back. My kids would think that was so cool. Um, it just looks very, very alien-like. Um, but then we also have our cup plant where these, the leaf bases form little cups for the insects to um, drink water from. So re really cool characteristic of a plant. One of my favorite plants to show kids is the obedient plant down here. On, on the bottom right, it if you twist the floret, it will stay in place, at least temporarily. And that's where it gets its name obedient because the flower stays in place. So very cool, interesting plants that you can add to your garden and kids will just be amazed by every day. Uh, one of my favorite go-to themed gardens for kids is um, a butterfly garden. Butterflies are these magical creatures really for all of us, but especially for kids. They bring about this um, fascination and joy. We're gonna be able to track their flight, admire their colors, their patterns on their wings. Um, and you can actually learn a lot um, about butterflies by just observing them in the garden. You can learn about their life cycle from the caterpillar to the butterfly as really their important role they play in pollinating plants. So with any butterfly garden, you wanna include plants that provide that food and shelter and are gonna attract those butterflies here. Um, so you wanna include plants that have really high amounts of nectar, like your sedum, your bee balm, your joe pie weed. And you also want blooms continuously from spring through fall so that you have nectar and flowers for them to visit all year. And then in order to observe the entire life cycle with our caterpillar to our butterfly, we also need to include host plants. Host plants, um, um, so butterflies have at least one special plant where they lay their eggs and the caterpillars are gonna eat the foliage and this is their host plant. And if you plant these in your garden, you have to be willing to accept that there may be some damage on them because that caterpillar is obviously gonna eat them. Um, but this is gonna be really cool for you to see the caterpillar all the way to the butterfly. 
So some of our host plants, um, you know, our monarch it host plant is milkweed. There's several varieties or species of milkweed that you can plant. And then our black swallowtail host plants are parsley, dill, and fennel. So plant those and you can see the, the caterpillars and butterflies in your garden. And bird gardens are also fun and very educational for the kids. You provide some plants with seeds for the birds and then track what birds visit the garden and maybe what plant they visit the most. So some plants um, for, for fall seeds, the, this cone flower here, down here, um, sunflowers and other great ones, zinnias. We just have to be careful when you're adding plants with berries as some of them may be toxic. So definitely check your list before adding berry plants. A heritage garden. Um, this design is gonna pay tribute to the gardens of the past. So growing heritage gardens allows us to you know, recapture those stories of our ancestors and pass them along to our children and our grandchildren. So maybe plant some family heirlooms or plants you remember your grandparents growing. Uh, maybe you're like me and remember your great grandparents growing hollyhocks and then creating hollyhock dolls out of them every year. I loved doing that. Um, or maybe there's some other plants you want your child to experience growing up like you did. Um, so this one may bring back a lot of great memories. You can also, excuse me, you can also introduce your child to a different culture through gardening. Um, create a space to grow plants that certain cultures grow, um, like a, a Japanese heritage garden could maybe include some bamboo or a Hispanic heritage garden include a lot of different varieties of spicy peppers. And what I see a lot in school gardens here in central Illinois is the Three Sisters Garden. And um, this is the, the native peoples from different parts of North America often planted corn and beans and squash together. And this trio is referred to as three sisters. So um, researching the different cultivar or the different cultures and what plants they grow and eat would be a great history lesson. And it's also gonna be able, um, you're also gonna be able to plant and maybe even eat some of the food. So it'll all make a nice connection. So this heritage garden is going to be um, really is a garden and is a form of living history. All right, plant a giant garden. Plant varieties that will grow super tall, like the giant sunflowers that can reach 15 feet tall or the pumpkins that can grow 150 pounds. Those are just amazing to kids. So give them a space where maybe they feel like the tiny insect crawling through the, the garden with these tall grasses towering above them or maybe plants with super big leaves like palms or cannas. You can include fun little decorations like this giant pot, oversized pot, or maybe a, a big chair. Um, sunflowers are, are just one of my favorite plants to have in the children's garden or you can go the opposite and maybe do a miniature garden and let the kids feel like the giant in the garden. So plant varieties that stay really small, use fairy or terrarium garden plants and decorations. Um, a lot of your ground covers are gonna cover your ground like carpet, stay low to the ground. And then you can go to your garden center and look for dwarf plants like the hostas with the teeny tiny leaves or the conifers that stay really compact, look like a regular evergreen, but stay really compact. Um, you can even plant these all together and use them as comparing and contrasting. Compare a giant pumpkin to a tiny pumpkin would be really fun to try out some summer. Food, it's so important to teach our kids where food comes from besides a grocery store. And we wanna offer them the opportunity to grow their own food and eat it. Um, there is a lot of research that says kids are more likely to eat fruits and vegetables if they grew it themselves. So super exciting. It doesn't have to be anything large or fancy or perfect. You know, start small with a four by four raised bed and select only a few things to grow. And if that's successful, maybe spread what you do next year. Um, or maybe your kid really loves a certain type of food. Create a garden using a favorite recipe like a salsa garden with tomatoes and garlic, cilantro and peppers, <laughs> or maybe a pizza garden. 
where you have everything growing in the garden that you would need to make pizza, like your tomatoes and your wheat, your basil, oregano, peppers and onions, or even just a simple salad garden. The things that you liked in your salad would be um, a fun thing to do. And then another food garden that I love, even though we can't eat from it, um, is a chocolate garden. We had a chocolate garden at the ISU Horticulture Center when I worked there and it was so popular. So we designed the garden with plants, with um, color of chocolate and names. The names have chocolate um, in them. So we have our, up here we have our dark chocolate or um, dark chocolate drop coleus. And here we have our dark chocolate baptisia. So these are just gorgeous plants that would be striking in, in the garden that dark foliage or dark blooms are really striking. And then you top it off with cocoa shell mulch. It was like chocolate icing on a cake. It smells absolutely delicious and gorgeous. We just have to be very careful using this as it is toxic to dogs as um, cocoa is. And why we can't eat anything from our chocolate garden. Um, maybe you'll come up with a really fun story about the chocolate fairies making their chocolate at night and leaving chocolate candies for their garden visitors to enjoy. So who doesn't love a little imagination and chocolate? Even though you don't see your fairies working, they are making chocolate in your chocolate garden. And then, of course, learning gardens. If you have young kids, and an educational theme can, can make learning a little more fun. So, for instance, an alphabet garden can help teach kids their ABCs in a fun way. You include plants to cover all 26 letters of the alphabet. Um, so, for example, we have A for ageratum and B for begonia and C for coleus. And then you make really creative signs to identify each plant and letter. And then learn your ABCs through the, the different plants in your garden. You can also teach kids about colors or mixing colors by creating a rainbow or a painter's palette garden. So incorporating colors of the rainbow into a, a children's garden is super easy. Kids love bright colors um, and bright colors add so much um, interest and brightness to a garden. So very easy to, to add that rainbow section. I love the mystery that an underground garden creates. It's so fascinating. So grow some of these plants that produce these underground root systems that can be dug up and maybe eaten by your kids. Um, we're gonna grow our plants. They all have very pretty, nice green, luscious foliage, and then go digging for these buried treasures once they're ready to harvest. The kids love harvesting these roots, um, just digging up and pulling them to see the mystery of what's hiding underneath the soil. The book Tops and Bottoms is a fun story to go along with the underground garden. Um, so for example here with our, our peanuts, not many kids are familiar with the way peanuts grow. Um, they eat peanut butter, they love peanuts, but they don't know how it, where it comes from. So plant these peanut plants and you expect the, the nuts to come in off the foliage um, and harvest them that way, but actually they're hiding underneath the ground. The kids get to dig up these peanuts um, hiding beneath the foliage and those really pretty yellow flowers. So I love underground gardens, giving the, the kids a chance to dig up their own potatoes and um, pull their radishes and beets. It's lots of fun to watch that. Do you have a kid that loves to read? I do. Um, a storybook theme can be created um, from plants or objects associated with a particular story or a character. So up here, our little Cinderella story, we can grow a giant pumpkin that we're gonna imagine can turn into a coach one evening. Um, or maybe we recreate Mr. McGregor's vegetable garden from Peter Robert. Um, that garden's absolute perfection and you'll have lots of fresh vegetables enjoy all summer. Um, and maybe you can share them with, with your rabbits too. Um, but this is a fun and kind of double fun and um, we get to eat the food. So one of my favorite books is The Lorax and these purple alliums remind me so much of truffle trees spread throughout the garden. So use your imagination and kind of um, think of plants that remind you of certain stories. 
So with allium, some of these varieties can be dried and used in arrangements or crafts later. And this is a spring bulb that will add some color to the garden before anything else is blooming. So one of my favorite spring bloomers. And if you're feeling really ambitious, um, pull out your hedge trimmers and maybe sculpt a character or some kind of structure into a, a hedge or an evergreen. Um, this one was in Longwood Garden, so it um, definitely took a lot of work and had a, had a lot of resources, but sure, you could create this in your something similar in your backyard. Um, so create this magical space where your little one can feel like they're part of a fairy tale or fable right outside their back door. Um, just by being creative and, and thinking outside the box when you're listening to that story next time. So an animal garden. Um, plants don't make animal noises, unfortunately, um, but a lot of them have animal names or maybe even resemble animals. So create this animal garden for a lot of kids who love animals. Um, some of the plants that share animal names are lamb's ear or dogwood, snapdragon, tiger lily, um, cat mint. So many, so many plants have animal names in them. Um, there are also a lot of even plants that look like animals. So one of my favorites, this bat-faced kufia on top, totally looks like a bat. I love it. It's, it's a small flower, but totally looks like a bat. And then we have our bird of paradise who really looks like a tropical bird sitting on top of this foliage. So be creative and um, maybe research some of the other plants that look like animals to include in your, your zoo garden. Um, and I also see a lot of farm animal gardens here locally. Um, they use pig squeak and hens and chicks, plants that start with farm animal names. So a lot of plants that, that have connections to animal names are available. And then art, art is wonderful. Um, it, it gives, an art garden can be a, a great place for that free form creativity with the kids. Making dyes or plant, dyes or paints um, from the plants and flowers is a great art activity, but also a great history lesson to know how people used to make dyes, um, to dye fabrics or paintings. A lot of our vegetables make really bright dyes. Um, onions create this yellow color. Beets are making this bright red. Carrots, top carrot tops can be green. The carrot um, root can make an orange dye. Parsley and mint make really great um, bright green dyes. So um, can research all kinds of plants that have been used to create dyes and make your own paintings or art with, um, with plants. And using um, dried flowers or foliage to create art is super easy and fun. Um, dried lavender is one of my favorite because it does smell so wonderful. Um, this giant grasshopper here is created from all dried plant material. My son fell in love with this a couple years ago at a garden locally. Um, but just thinking outside the box how plants can be used to create art um, would be a lot of fun. So give the, give the kids a space to create um, beautiful structures or pieces of art in the garden too would be a great opportunity. Um, maybe paint a bench or a pot or several pots or even picket fences that are around the garden. One of the Master Gardener projects in my unit had their students each paint a self-portrait on the picket fence. And it was just so unique, so colorful, and just highlighted the diversity of all of the kids that attended that after-school program. It was super neat. Um, so horticulture and really designing with plants is a form of art in itself. Um, so be creative for your art garden and um, use plants in a unique way to create beautiful art. So a career or hobby garden um, is really going to foster your kiddo's current hobby or maybe career aspirations. Maybe you have someone that wants to be an astronaut. Um, create a garden full of plants that have names that like Blazing Star or Cosmos that would be fun for them to explore in. Um, is your child into music? There are a lot of plants that have musical names like bellflower or bugleweed 
or um, creating musical instruments from natural materials or out in the garden, um, not in our house. It can be outside and make all kinds of noises that they want. Sounds amazing. Uh, maybe build a mini landscape. This one's gonna require a lot of um, planning and work, but maybe build a mini landscape with door for low growing plants for a miniature train set to chug through. Um, what kid who um, loves trains wouldn't love a garden like that? That would be amazing. And then maybe you have a child who loves, absolutely loves dinosaurs like mine. Um, grow plants outside that were around when dinosaurs were alive, like our ferns, our ginkgo, our conifers, and then let them take their dinosaurs outside to recreate these prehistoric times. And you can add fossils and they can do matching with dinosaurs and footprints. Um, so it ties in that learning and exploring with their and playing with their dinosaurs. And then rocks. I think every single kid goes through a rock collection phase of collecting those interesting rocks they find along the road or in their landscaping or wherever it may be. Um, so create, create a rock garden where they can put their treasures and incorporate different um, colors and textures of these succulents or sedums or drought tolerant plants. I think that would be super fun to do. Sensory gardens. Um, so I would be remiss if I didn't include this one. But remember, it all comes back to engaging their senses, their sight, their smell, touch, taste, and sound. So sensory gardens have this fantastic benefit for children. Um, it really plays an important role in developing their pathways for learning in their brains. Um, so for sight, you want to include a variety of colors and interesting textures throughout the garden to visually appeal to them. Um, great textured plants to maybe feel are this lamb's ear with the fuzzy leaves. The succulents have this smooth, silky leaf. And then cone flowers are, have this spiky seed head that um, is around where the, the bloom is there. So very cool. And all of these are, are visually appealing as well. Um, herbs are for a great, um, unique sensory experience in, an, in a sensory garden. They smell wonderful. A lot of them are very easy to grow. And that some of them can even be tasted if they're correctly identified. So lavender here is very easy to grow and you can dry the blooms um, once the, the flower dies down. And then our sound, um, sound happens naturally in the garden with our birds chirping or our insects buzzing. But there are some plants that can make sounds too. So this tall ornamental grass is gonna swish back and forth in the wind or maybe rustle as the kids run through them. So a lot of um, calming sounds and they also make great hiding places or barriers too. And then water, we can't have a sensory garden without water. Kids love to play in the water, uh, but this can be as simple as a butterfly puddle or a bird bath, or if you want moving water in a fountain or a stream, you can even have these simple small watering cans or containers for them to water their own garden. But this is a, a great um, thing to consider in any garden as kids love water. So sensory gardens are a great place to journal or draw, or they can also be used as this calming place that engages and, and calms their senses. So I have, if you really wanna dig in deeper to children's gardens, um, there's three great books that I have found. I'm sure there's a ton more out there, but these have been really useful to me um, to really get more inspiration, dig deeper into some of those topics. Um, so if you search online for themed children's gardens, you will find tons of cute ideas, fun ideas that you can incorporate into your own garden. There's a lot of ideas out there or visiting your children's gardens throughout um, your area and getting some, some ideas, some inspiration. So the, the plants and the part they play in our, our children's lives and environment are, are really just the starting point. Our children will learn to care for what they first learned to love. So it's my hope that the ideas I share with you today will 
kind of boost your imagination and curiosity and maybe awaken your own childhood sense of wonder. Um, I think now more than ever, our children deserve the best green spaces to grow. And what a great gift we can give our children is a garden of their own. And just remember these, these are ideas and spaces for our children, a space purely for their benefit and enjoyment. Benjamin Franklin once said, tell me and I'll forget, teach me and I'll remember, involve me and I'll learn. So have fun gardening with your child and giving them their space to garden. And if you have any questions, definitely type them into the chat box. Excellent work. So inspiring, Brittany. Just, just lovely. I, I was lost in the presentation thinking about all these cool gardens. So, so thanks for that. Um, we'll begin with questions now. There were a lot of comments that came in. Um, if people have to sign off, do you want to advance another slide and then they'll have a chance to take the evaluation? So, of course, you could, this is recorded, but if you want to scan this with your mobile device, or um, what I'll do is uh, when I get a chance here, I'll put the direct link in the chat box for the evaluation. Uh, but just some comments here uh, that I think you could maybe elaborate on. Just, I love this from uh, Riley, just saying that the garden doesn't have to be fancy. When she was a child, she was allotted a dirt patch about two by 16 feet and just spent endless hours there as a, as a child making mud pies, even going as far as mud soup and uh, ultimately planted four clocks, which are still there to this day. So yeah, the, those stories just, just blow me away. So um, excellent, thanks for sharing. Uh, Riley also mentioned adding a bird bath or some kind of watering station for bees and butterflies. Do you wanna comment that, uh, adding that to the uh, butterfly themed garden? Yeah, the, the butterflies are always um, popular in our garden. We want to provide that habitat. The, the pollinators need food and they need water. So that is a, a great addition. Those are going to provide that, that um, supplemental nutrition for our pollinators, but then also um, be aware that our kids may play in that bird bath or watering station as well, which is okay. Um, I, I don't mind when my kids do that but absolutely great addition to a butterfly garden. Great, thank you. And um, regarding cocoa mulch, um, when it gets wet, you know, from the rain, one comment on it becoming uh, quite slimy. Have you had that experience before? It does break down rather quickly. We, we usually put it down a couple times throughout the year just to make it um, fresh and, and nice looking. So you will have to reapply it a couple times. It's not gonna be like your hardwood mulch where you're once and done for the year. So maybe top it off every once in a while to, to make it look pretty and fresh again. Great. And then just some other comments, if you wanna check out the chat box yourself, just um, botanic garden using chocolate plants, Epcot doing um, kids activities with herbs and teas. And even one person commented on uh, painting using uh, the flower petals to paint. Have you done that before, Brittany? I have. So like, like taking the dandelion and smearing it is one e simple example. Um, I've also seen kids um, pound with a, paper, with a flower petal. So you put the, like a piece of paper down, layer it, or then stack on some petals, pretty flowers or leaves, and then put a, um, another piece of paper and hammer it and then you take it off and it leaves a really pretty um, impression of the plant so even if you don't make dyes or paint with it you can still get color from the petals so that is fun as well oh that sounds nice I, I think I'll have to do that one yeah uh, flower pounding is flower pounding okay super fun. yep how about stepping stones any tips for for doing stepping stones with youth um, I have made stepping stones with the simple kits with kids before. Um, it is messy, but it is a fun way to um, create art and then they can add that stepping stone to the garden. Um, be creative of different rocks or even painting it when they're done. 
And then it gives them a little ownership too of, I created that art or created that stone in my garden. So great example. Excellent. And then uh, Jane shared an alternative. If, if you have native gardens and you wanted to find an alternative to something like uh, lamb's ear, um, she likes Robin's flea bane, or um, I know it as Robin's plantain, but it does have a nice uh, fuzzy leaf. So good uh, suggestion there. Yeah. And then we had um, Kate ask, have you, have you ever had to send a proposal to put a garden in a certain area? And if so, what do you include? Um, here at Extension, the site usually comes to us. So I've never proposed a garden be built. Um, so I think it's going to depend on where you want to put it, who you're working with, if it's a municipality or a school or a hospital, wherever it may be, um, of what they're looking for. But um, use your extension office as a resource or contact me if you have questions when you're putting in a proposal. But I, it's totally going to depend on probably your area. Um, but I would include maybe a simple design and then ways to use the garden afterwards. So we can all put in a garden, but I think what really matters is how we're going to use it afterwards, how we're going to educate it from it or let the kids explore. So make sure you highlight um, how, what the purpose is and how you plan to use it. Don't just focus on making it pretty. Yes, all good points. And Christina asked, does Extension have a list of children's books which involve gardening? Um, I know I have a bunch over here in my bookshelf, but I don't think we have a list. Um, if you contact your Extension office or even me, I can send you some um, titles of my favorite ones that I've used for various ages. Um, but there are, there are a lot of great children's gardening books out there. There's some fun ones. And Kate just followed up with, um, as far as what to include in the garden. Um, Kate, some things that come to mind is definitely, you know, if you want the butterfly garden, you know, a full sun area for sure. So they'll like basking, but I also like to have like a tree nearby or shade cover for break times with, with youth. Cause if you're in the dead heat of the, of the summer and the sun constantly, some kind of break space is nice. Um, so make sure you have a good water source as well to, to get the garden established. Um, so that's something to think about proximity to your water source and, you know, good soil as well. Um, and then uh, that uh, the bookworm gardens in Sheboygan, that was that location in Wisconsin, Andy wrote, uh, their gardens are all themed around books. So I thanks for sharing. Yeah, that sounds like a field trip, Brittany. It does. <laughs> um, and then Jane add, uh, there's a junior master gardener uh, program literature in the garden with lots of book titles and lessons for gardening. Mm -hmm. So great resources. Thanks for sharing audience. And uh, Kate also asked, do you have any information for the junior master gardener program uh, in Illinois? So each um, extension office probably has their own um, set of like junior master gardener programs. There's not a specific one for Illinois. So here in our, our unit, we probably have five, five or six projects that are junior master gardener projects. Um, but the junior master gardener program is through, I wanna say it's through Texas A&M. They have great curriculum for um, teachers and then workbooks for students. So you could check that out on their website, um, but anybody can lead Junior Master Gardener education and anybody can do the program. They do get little certificates for completing it. Um, it is a, a great program, great curriculum, um, but I would say we don't have an Illinois Junior Master Gardener program. It's, it's individual um, counties that run those programs. And could you uh, share the ideal age for um, junior MG? Junior, um, it, it could be anywhere from probably five years old to 18 years old would be your junior master gardener. The, they do have curriculum for like preschool and then they have middle school curriculum. 
So um, I would say the, the generic one is probably your elementary grade kids. And then there's a wildlife curriculum and there's like a discovery one for middle school kids. So it can, it can be adapted for any age, but I would say most likely your elementary is gonna get the most. Um, yeah, and the junior master gardener curriculum is through, I wanna say it's Texas A&M, is that right, Nancy? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yep, and Riley just asked that. And one other question came in about soil. Do you have any ideas for soil investigations for kids? Um, so I have done a fun little lesson with the which the kids, and you can email me when you're um, after this and I can send it to you, but it's like they're an alien and they go out and explore the soil and bring it back and try to identify all the makeups of the soil. So the organic matter and the rocks and everything that would make up a soil. Um, it really gets them to think about soil, um, not just soil as a whole, but all the different components that make up soil. Um, so they dig up, dig it up and then really look at it through a microscope or magnifying glass to, and then divide out if they find insects or anything else. Um, so I, I like doing that one with the kids. Um, Okay, and how about um, the difference between Junior MG and 4-H? So Junior Master Gardener is going to be um, strictly in the garden doing um, like after school programs or through school groups. Um, it's a curriculum that you could offer a 4-H club. So 4-H um, covers a wide range of areas for um, youth development. So this horticulture and gardening is a topic that you could teach those 4-Hers. Um, you know, that explains it. Nancy, I don't know if you can help me with explain that a little bit. Sure. Um, yeah, I think I think you hit it on the head. I mm -hmm. mean, 4-H 4 4-H could basically 4-H will develop clubs and, and you typically the, the club leader or the student club members will actually lead their project goals themselves. So they may pick a garden theme. And certainly there, there's actually a lot of 4-H curriculum in relation to garden themes. So <clears throat> I would look, um, look into that. I know Purdue has a, a nice set of curriculum, um, but 4-H could be much broader. You know, it could be a robotics club. Um, it could be like teens as teachers club. So it's much broader, but certainly if you hone in on 4-H garden projects, I think you'll find some really useful curriculum and materials out there. And someone asked about the recording. This will go on our YouTube page. Um, so, so in the reminder, I'll remind you of this evaluation via email and we'll have the direct link to the YouTube page and we just have to edit closed captioning before it gets up there. So um, give us a couple weeks on that. But I think that wraps up the question. Just great comments. Uh, well done, Brittany. We'll stick around a couple more minutes if anything else comes in. And again, thanks to our interpreters today. I know you made uh, uh, audience members days. So we really appreciate that. It's very helpful. Yes, thank you so much for joining and happy gardening this summer.